Hello and welcome. My name is Gerd Melak from seoleverage.com and today I'm very pleased to welcome Anthony Chansamuth to this podcast. Welcome, Anthony. Great to be here, Gerd. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. I had the pleasure to meet you personally at the Superfast Business Live event in March in Sydney. We also bumped into um, Ilana Wexler, who is on another episode of this podcast talking about the paid side of, of content. And um, I know you a sort of a copywriting expert. Your name drops, uh, comes up more and more in conversations when we talk about who could write copy, who could um, put together a case study and stuff like that. Could you maybe briefly introduce your background or tell our listeners where you come from? How do you end up writing copy, creating case studies for the top names really in the marketing space? Yeah, so uh, I started writing copy probably about a decade ago, um, but I didn't know it was copy. I didn't know the phrase copywriting. I didn't know these things, right? So I essentially, I started a blog in 2009, uh, a personal blog just to put my ideas out um, on things that I was learning at the time. I started to learn social media marketing. I was getting into Facebook, into Twitter. Um, LinkedIn wasn't a thing yet. Uh, and people then started to, uh, I guess, um, start to make comments around some of the things I was publishing and, and you know, I was, I was starting to see people engage with the content. So people were starting to, you know, I would put a post on Facebook and um, usually where most people were writing one or two sentences, I was writing what we know now know as long form. Um, so I was writing, you know, epic essays, you know, here's a whole idea or thought or an experience I had on the weekend. Um, and a lot of it ha didn't really have to do with business. A lot of it was right. just my, my life experience mm -hmm. uh, or I met someone cool, like I was at this conference with Gert and we had this nice chat, right? Like, so it's um, what I learned to develop over time was what, and what I was always testing for was what were the words or the phrases or the elements of the content that would resonate or would elicit an emotion and then would re enlist a response. So I'm looking for a like, I'm looking for a comment, I'm looking for a share, uh, which uh, you know anyone who's, who's listened to this knows all these things. Um, this is important for uh, content marketing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, long story short, I, I, I ended up launching a um, Facebook advertising agency with a friend of mine um, back in 2011. Uh, he was the, the, the technician so he's the one going in running or doing all the campaigns for the clients and understanding the world of facebook ads uh, i was the strategist so for me i was looking at what are the campaigns going to look like what's the creative that, that we need what's um what is the objective you know how, how do we measure and, and track success right? right um but what the what the two of us work really nicely because I, he could tell me, okay, these are the things that, that, that we can measure and these are the things that the budget are required and you know, cost per click and all these things. And, and I, could, I could, I guess, translate that to the client and say, well, your goal is to generate more sales or more leads mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, who's the audience you're talking to? So I would start to essentially map out a content strategy with the client, right? Mm -hmm. um, didn't call it content strategy back then, right? So... Uh, after that business ran for about two years, we were, we, we, the challenge of running the, that first business was we were making sales, revenue was gener uh, increasing month for month, but we knew nothing about profit. Uh, and so we were not <laughs> making a profit and we were not paying ourselves a salary. Right? Been there, done uh, <laughs> <laughs> so common story for a lot of people. Yep. Uh, and so so we, we hung our hats and said, you know what, this isn't working. Um, I'm, I'm tired of sleeping on my auntie's couch. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it might sound great for Airbnb, but it's not working for me. Um, and okay. so so we, we I, I gave it up, like well, basically said, okay, let's, let's move on. He's gone on to do his own thing. I went and just coached people for a while. So for a while I was helping people with um, business and career coaching just to, to help people. Like What I'm really great at is actually listening to uh, interviewing people and listening to the real motivations and drivers and concerns that they have mm -hmm. uh, and then translating that into some kind of okay, action plan or some kind of strategy to move forward to achieve the desired outcome that they want for their lives or for their businesses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that training really helped me move into the next phase of what I was doing. I got hired as uh, the marketing lead or the marketing manager for Hub Australia, which is the, one of the largest co-working uh, communities mm -hmm. or co-working spaces in Australia. 
uh, and I ran their marketing for two years, right? And a, a big piece of that was working out what are the different pillars uh, that we would have to to uh, run in order to be successful to generate n- new leads for the co-working space. Um, so we had three locations then. Since I've left, they've doubled in size. They've got six locations now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and a big core element of that was content. How would we, mm-hmm. what, how can we use content to actually attract um, and, and there was other things like PR strategy and there was partnership strategy and, and other things, which you can see that I do, you just asked me before we, we start to hit record, you know, I do a lot of these networking stuff and I'm talking to people all the time. Uh, that's because I see and, and appreciate the value of partnerships. Uh, mm-hmm. And I see, yeah, when, when you do partnerships really well, um, you know, content kind of, it's very easy to do content then because we can just say, hey, why don't we just do a, a blog exchange or why don't we guest post for each other or can we can just create a guide together and, and, and that is something we put out as a, as a, as a joint entity. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so then, so then I, I left, the, I, I was in there for two years as a marketing manager for that company, uh, took a break, got married, uh, then, you know, at that point in time, to be honest, I got burnt out. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very, it was a very stressful environment. Um, and then, uh, I went, became a digital nomad with my wife and we went traveling for 18 months and I worked from my laptop consulting, um, for different companies. And I was for, for about a year, I was, um, just freelance copywriter. Uh, and, and I did some work with B Ninjas, which is, they were actually one of my first clients. So I worked with Meryl Johnston and um, also a member of the Superfast community. Uh, and uh, I really, she came to me and said, you know what, I'm an accountant, not really great, not very creative. Uh, and I need someone to be able to put out content that's going to be attractive to our, our potential customers. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. uh, and I said, well, I'm not an accountant, so I can't talk about the numbers, but I can definitely uh, communicate to people and, and, and ex- express some of the concepts that are important for them to understand, like profit first, like, you know, P&L, uh, profit and loss, and these other things. Uh, and so um, then I started off as just writing um, content for, for Bee Ninjas. Uh, actually, the first piece of content I wrote for, for her, or for, for, for them, um, was a case study. They actually, what she said was, can you interview one of my clients uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and turn that into a case study that we can put onto the website? Um, and so that's how, you know, that was the first piece of work that I did for, for, for Bee Ninjas. And that eventually led into uh, three years later, me becoming the, the marketing manager for the company mm-hmm. um, and then coming up with a content strategy, developing that, uh, working out how, how could we take the number one position uh, for outsourced bookkeeping uh, in Australia. Uh, and then around that time, we also expanded into the US and into the UK markets. Uh, and so we then had to work out what, would, what strategy would we use in terms of marketing uh, and, and content uh, mm-hmm. for those regions, right? Um, in 2020, something happened which was significant. We basically pivoted the focus of the business to uh, e-commerce and focusing on e-commerce clients, um, 100% uh, seven figure, so million dollar companies uh, and help and supporting them with a outsourced, um, like a CFO service, mm-hmm. uh, you know, combined with the bookkeeping, but, but that's the beginning of the story. And, and right. as you know, yeah, there's been a whole bunch of different things we've tested, like podcasts. We've tested, uh, we did 100 plus episodes of the Bean Ninjas podcast over the last four years. Um, we've done webinars, we've done events, we've done conferences, we've done a whole bunch of things. And I can give you sort of more insight into that if you have any specific questions. Um, mm-hmm. And then, so this year, uh, again, due to the pandemic and things like that, um, there was essentially uh, an opportunity for me to rebuild um, my own brand and, and, and the work that I've been doing and kind of move out of the shadows of being this, this hidden marketing guy for these companies <laughs> and, and be like, well, he actually has, he started off with a company called Simple Creative Marketing, which is my own registered business. Um, and I've been running under that, that, that entity for the last five years. Uh, it's just I haven't done a great job of, of really marketing it um, until this year. So this year I've been really active into getting onto podcast, uh, running my own podcast where we've had you on there as well as a guest, and, and I really appreciated that. Um, and uh, and now people are starting to see, oh, what's this guy and, and what's SEM all about? And uh, we've predominantly focused on case study marketing, mm. uh, which is something that we can also talk about. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So so I I get the idea that you kind of pretty much touched on everything that's content in the in the last last years. It's interesting that you have essentially also both 
parts of experience to put it that way so you have worked as an in-house specialist in the content area you've done it externally have an overview about different industries so so definitely um you know your stuff when it comes to content content is really the main topic of this first season of of podcast episodes we are putting together because content yeah they, they say content is king but for seo and really for search marketing it's it's the the very reason why someone is going to find you right so we see content less than on social media to attract engagement attract likes attracts i don't know what we see it just as a, as a re the simple reason why somebody is going to find your brand and if this content is valuable they're going to memorize you so the way content works and when clients start working with us is very often that they kind of think this uh, this topic could be interesting for my clients i know my clients i know they find it interesting i write about it it doesn't get ranked it doesn't bring traffic it doesn't bring leads I get frustrated. I do another one. I do this three times. I might do this even for two years in a row and then get really frustrated and then I stop, right? Or I might hire someone like you who says like, let's, let's take this from the right approach. So I think there's just a lot of things people are getting completely wrong about content. So I was really wondering you as an, as an expert in this field, what would be like the main mistakes, the main misconceptions you see out there um, that people are or, or like false beliefs they have kind of internalized yeah that's a great question and i'm, I'm going to i guess um contextualize sort of my expertise in the area i work with so i typically work with b2b professional services um and uh, and also some of my clients are software companies so you could, could call them SaaS, but they, mm -hmm. they like to call themselves software companies once they grow <laughs> beyond a certain size. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so if, if someone's listening to this and they, they fall out of that, um, these principles will also work. You just need to tailor and customize to your industry mm -hmm. and, 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 and the way the way um, the way you do content. But most of the things that you talk about, even in, I, I know you did an episode uh, early on where you talk about, you know, uh, content specifically, like how, how to put out good content that, that can rank. Um, let's talk about some of these principles. The first thing sort of mistake that I see a lot uh, with with small business is uh, un what I say, unclear, unclear brand and value proposition. So um, like just what you just noted here, the goal of content uh, there's two. One typically is to attract. So you're trying to get people to your website. Mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to, um, you know, uh, get them to then once they're on the site, okay, maybe that you want them to convert in some way. So you want them to join your email list. You want them to buy something from you. Um, it, it should, well, sales should be number one, but you know, but some people, maybe they're not at that stage. Maybe they're pre-launch and they just want to build the list, right? Um, the thing is you need to think about the perspective of the user, right? And I think you've had Greg Merrillis on as well, um, yeah. talking about user experience. Uh, you need to put yourself in the mind of the user and think, okay, well, what does the buyer want, right? Um, why are they coming here? Uh, they're wanting results, right? So if they've got a challenge or problem, so, you know, maybe, you know, I've, I'm a digital agency and I, I'm looking at my, my content and I, like you say, I've been publishing for the last two years and I'm getting crickets. My traffic hasn't really increased my much. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to need to work with an SEO expert, uh, a consultant like Gert. I'm going to go to SEO leverage and, and then book in a consultation or an audit, right? Um, but the reason I'm doing that is because I expect that the expert's going to tell me or help me fix the problem. Yeah. Um, so when I talk about unclear brand and value proposition, the, the often it's not clear in the content what you do and how you do it and who you do it for. Right. right. Um, it, I see a lot of generic content. I'm sure you have where it's like, here's the concept um, and you know, oh, let's, okay, the content maybe doesn't some, you know, you go into Google right now and you type in content strategy right as a keyword because you're you're wanting or maybe you're putting content plan because you want a content plan for your own business and you're going to find millions of results and you're going to go okay i'm going to probably pick the, the top three or whatever on page one of, of google um now those guys have done a great job so i'm going to say those for those for the most part they're fine in terms of what they've done but if you skip to page 10 okay or even page five probably um, the three or two i was going to say yeah <laughs> or two or three, maybe. yeah you're good point right you can see um you know like the the content is very generic they might give concepts and explanations of what content strategy means or, or what a content plan is uh 
but what they don't do is actually indicate and demonstrate how what's unique about the way they do it what's unique about their approach and they don't include or embed within that content case studies they don't actually say because i we applied this content strategy to this business this is the result that they got right so as you're reading that 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 article um, or watching the video or whatever it is you know what would be useful for your buyer is to see oh you've, you've actually you're not just speaking from theoretical knowledge you've actually applied uh, the practice, okay, and you've generated results for your clients. And he, you've right. actually stated in the piece of content, you stated here are three case studies um, where we've actually done this and it worked. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now that is what I mean by a clear brand and value proposition. I'm not going to get into the whole branding conversation. I don't think you can yeah. have a brand strategist on here to talk about that. But um, that, that's the first mistake I see. Mm -hmm. The second mistake that, that I see is um, businesses that lead with the product or service first instead of building an audience, right? Mm -hmm. So they're thinking, um, to your point, okay, this is typically when I, when I work with people, what happens? They, they get an idea for a piece of content. And they go, okay, that, that's a good uh, idea. Maybe they do their, their client avatar pr process and they work out a common pain point is, um, you know, the, the, the the, the clients, the agencies, they don't have a clear SEO strategy, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's a common pain point. Um, so then they start publishing content on this uh, or they, they've got a product that they want to sell. They've got a course and this is this for anyone who's course creating. This is a major issue is people have these ideas for courses. They spend all their work building the product, right? They're going to go, I'm going to create this epic course. Um, you know, and then they, they launch it uh, and it goes to crickets and they don't get any sales. Right, um, where they get the one sale from their buddy who just is, is supporting them, right? Um, and the problem is the audience has not been built. So uh, where I see there's an issue with with B two B content specifically is you know if you're putting articles up on LinkedIn for example, um, which is common for B two B, but you only have ten people connected to you, right, or fifty people, right? That's very different to someone like a James Shramko who has 10,000 plus people connected to him. And every time he publishes something on his feed, right, people are commenting and engaging with it because the audience is already built in, right? There's an example, uh, a real case study where I worked with a client who uh, his content really sucked on LinkedIn. Uh, and he knew it. Like he, he was putting stuff up every day. A lot of it was uh, curating content. So he would, you know, read a great article, he'd put it into his buffer, and then that would. Uh, you know, uh, schedule it out and, and it come up links, links, links uh, on his feed. So if you looked at his feed, all it was was a, a bunch of shared articles, right? Um, yeah. And sometimes he'd add one or two sentences to, to add his two cents to it, uh, but it wasn't really creating the kind of engagement that he wanted. It wasn't generating him leads, people were not contacting him, right? Mm -hmm. So when he hired me, what we worked on first was, now the, the thing that he had done really well was he had built up the audience. So he actually had connected with, um, so he, he worked a lot with coaches and consultants and things like this. So he connected with that audience and did connect requests and things like that. And he went out and he did public speaking. So that was a, a big thing for him at the time. Yeah. Um, and he built that, that audience, right? Um, and so when we, I took him through the process of a framework for writing content and actually uh, it was writing a content for him. Um, I helped him pull out specific stories and then we turned it into really, you know, LinkedIn has, a, I think, a 1200 character limit for a post. Um, and so within 1200 characters, uh, we were able to then put out a, you know, a post, to publish a post on his um, LinkedIn feed. The first one, I think, had around 15,000 views. Then the second one had 70,000 plus views, right? Um, it, now, I'm not going to, like, it sounds all magical and not all night. It took us a month to get to that point because I had to do a lot of work with him on the first mistake, which is, brand, clear brand and value proposition. Yeah. We, I had to understand from him, how do you actually serve the customer? What is your story? Um, and, and how does it relate to the customer, right? What what insights can have you learned over the years that, that you know, if you were to share those insights would be valuable to your audience, your potential buyer. Uh, and that's what, what I was able to extract from him. And then, then we produce the content, yeah? So when you lead with the product first or the service first, and not think about the audience, you have a problem, all right? Um, mm -hmm. In most cases, most of your content needs to educate first before it sells, 
right? Um, and you would, uh, would you agree with that, Gert, with content? Absolutely, absolutely. We have, been, we have people who follow our content essentially for months and sometimes years before they're really ready and, and have like understood a lot um, or enough about SEO so they can really build up some trust. And in SEO, we have like, trust is a really big issue because obviously SEO, there are no guarantees. Whoever gives a guarantee is lying. Um, there are, it's, a, it's, it's something everybody wants and it's very achievable with a consistent effort, but there are no guarantees, right? And it's a long-term thing. So people really put in a lot of time to decide and they think it's good that they do that. Um, but in over this time, they're going to consume content. And I think this happens in a lot of cases. We were working with language courses we are working with coaching clients with marketing experts with e-commerce businesses and everybody essentially tells me the same e-commerce might have a, like a shorter decision span but we're working with construction companies and people sometimes start engaging with their content two years before they actually purchase the property they then want to renovate right so what are you doing over this time span you're consuming content and getting closer and closer and closer to your decision making process and when whatever question you put in there in Google, there is a certain company, a certain business, a certain brand giving you the exact answer, walking you through the steps you need at this, pay, at this point to really um, figure things out that help you. I think that's definitely great. And I really love the point you're making about the value proposition because I've, I've been spending months and years probably refining what we think is our value proposition. We were mm -hmm very much we're very much focusing on transparency and a lot of client communication a lot of client updates sending them loom videos see look this is this is what's happening why is this important do you know what it is because we know a lot of companies essentially that hire an seo don't really know what they're doing they, yes. they know they have to spend quite some money it's an investment to do seo um and if you're not sure what's going to happen with this money how this is employed is this, if, if they're ripping you off or is this really in your best interest I think it is it is an issue. So we right from the start have made it our value proposition to really go a little bit against the grain here and say, look, I'm going to hold my client's hands and being 100% transparent of what we think is the best approach and why. And so this is where we are. This is the next step. Do you understand why this is the next step? Yes, you do. Let's go for it. And this over time has been then creating a momentum for our clients. This is really getting great results but it comes all down to what you're saying to be really really clear and have no doubt at all about who you serve and how you are going to do this and then it is not really a competition issue because everybody has their own way of doing this and everybody essentially is going to attract a different kind of client over time yeah, there's a great concept. I love what you just shared there. Uh, there's a great concept that I learned from a guy by the name of Glenn Carlson. He runs a company called Dent um, and there's a book called Key, Key Person of Influence. Highly recommend you read that or whoever's listening to this because um, a, a lot of my philosophy around just brand uh, and content is formulated from their theories, which has been well-researched. Um, and, and something that he talks about uh, is that we often think about a target market. Um, so this common phrase in marketing world is, you know, what's yeah. your target market or your target audience? Um, and, and what he's been able to demonstrate and seen through working with you know, literally thousands of businesses uh, is that you that the, the leading companies actually create their own markets. Um, and what, what we mean by that is Tim Ferriss talked about this in, I think he talked about it in the four hour work week. Um, he calls it like creating your own category and owning your, owning that category. So, and he was able to do that. You know, his category was lifestyle design. No one had heard of lifestyle design until Tim yeah. Ferriss came along with that book, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in the same, in a similar essence, that's actually actually what I'm doing with case study marketing, right? Like, like if you Google search case study marketing, there's not, not content on it, no one's talking about it, but I'm literally going out there and going, that's a keyword I'm going to own, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it's very strategic in that sense. And I wanna put to the listener right now, you know, what's your, if you were to own a, a category in your industry or in your niche, what is that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Gert could be transparency in SEO, right? That's probably something that, you know, people want but no one's talking about it well, no one's um, searching about it yeah yeah right and that's okay right so your role as the, the ceo or the voice or, or the marketing person is to communicate what is the category that that you excel in mm -hmm. um to give an, a, another real example for being ninjas we are you know the 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 outsourcing um 
uh, accounting uh, department for you know seven figure plus e-commerce businesses right so mm -hmm. it's a very clear this is the proposition this is what we do and who we do it for right um and so that's that's the audience we talked about the proposition number three um coming back to the mistakes is just focusing on the wrong content um and, and when i talk about this there's something that happens where i see this a lot in the b2b what we'll do is we'll publish some article or something which is like this is an industry update right it's like this is something that we learned oh there's a new algorithm change google's you know the panda thing came and then the next thing came and and you might put that out there to on your blog um the the question i would have to that is would your users actually care right would your buyers care about that update uh, and, and if they if you think they would you have to explain why it matters to them yeah so it's not enough just to say oh hey by the way facebook have changed the algorithm yeah and this is something i've done in the past which is a big mistake because no one cares the only people who care are other marketers like me <laughs> and exactly. they're not my customer yeah right um so we call this parallel content or i was actually i think it was Rand fishkin from seo moz back then uh, um, what's he doing now he's doing spark toro um so he talked about this concept of parallel content right um and then the other issue that i see with we're focusing on the wrong content is so much focus on inbound, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know it's hot topic. If you search inbound marketing, it's you know you see probably HubSpot own or the the the, <laughs> the resultant part page one uh, because they actually that's the category that they decided to own. They decided we would own inbound marketing as a concept, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, published a ton of content on that. If you look at their philosophy and and what you know, the what they sell to their, the the product they sell to their, their customers it's all focused on this one thing called inbound marketing right mm -hmm. um and the issue i see with that is in order to generate sales for your business especially if you're in that first one to three years and you're in that what we call a startup phase or a launch phase as you would know good it actually you know also helps to have real conversations with real people it actually also helps to pick up the phone and call someone and say hey i think i can help your business or or, or reach out for them through for a cold email or a warm email if you can make that happen mm -hmm. um, or like what we've done shop at events go to a conference and meet people and have conversations and share what you do yeah. um, the next level above that would be to actually go up on a stage and speak in front of the or in front of the audience and, and give them you know even a 10 minute talk about here's one thing that you you need to know about your seo or for me here's one thing you need to know about content marketing yeah. right um, and straight away you you build credibility and trust uh, because you're seen as the expert you're seen as a specialist mm -hmm. right and it takes courage you know there's that statistic that um or common phrase which is more people would prefer to be in the casket rather than giving the eulogy right um and it's it's it, that's, that's the thing why are we so scared about speaking why are we so scared about just sharing what we do and i love that you've got this podcast and you're doing speaking more speaking engagements um because that's building authority right um, absolutely I, I want to i want to just just um add this space i i do believe so in i think inbound marketing definitely has its place i do agree with you that it's not the thing when you just start out that's going to give you revenue in order to pay your bills in the first year. Um, I, I do know we've I've built several businesses based on inbound marketing and essentially it was the driving force. It took one or two years to get there. But for yes. example, having a podcast, talking about pain points, getting a brand known to a level where you say, okay, you, you can be the authority. I got, I got it too high once. We did a, a tech, technical support um, brand here in Spain. Uh, a few years ago, and we were representing or, or offering tech support for an e-commerce software back then. It was PrestaShop. And we got to a level where people called us when they had been through three different software firms that couldn't solve their issue. So we were like the, the ultimate resource. Uh, they asked, and we got a lot of things we, we couldn't handle. There were three software companies wow. before us. We couldn't do magic either. But definitely the inbound marketing was working. So they heard, they listened to our podcast months, uh, month after month. Uh, this was like a software. This was uh, quite a lot in the DIY space, I remember. Yeah. But we had, we had we like this work. inbound marketing does work, but definitely it's a very long game. So if you can build this up, we have clients that started creating content in 2011. They still get content, get leads from that content in 2020, but it was right from the start planned as something that is going to 
go on and on and on. And every month we publish two blog posts about questions their clients ask, for example, right? So, yes. so definitely um, I see the point you're saying, the first sales are coming from conversations, not from people finding you because there is a long trust process. There is a long, um, a long decision-making process and relations take time to get established. And doesn't there, isn't there a window from the time you say you had a, uh, you started publishing content on your blog or on your website? Isn't there a window before Google actually starts ranking it? Like it doesn't happen straight away. Exactly, especially when your site doesn't have what we call an authority status. Okay, so there are sites out there that have an authority status in your niche and their niche and whatever they publish. Take big brands, moz.com, ahrefs.com, for example. They've got authority status in, in SEO, for example. When they publish an article, it's not going to take long to rank in a very solid position already. Plus, they know what to do afterwards to make this content, uh, get this content in front of the right eyeballs and, and get links and social engagement and all those things as well. Um, mm. But once a site has this authority status, it's easier. If a normal site that doesn't have this has hardly any links pointing to them, hardly any social engagement, puts out an article, probably during a few weeks, nothing is going to happen. Google eventually says, ah, oh, there's no content, not sure if what I should do about it. Should I rank it? Should I index it? So after a few months, this content is going to appear somewhere on page six, page seven, maybe, if they don't do this strategically. Um, so content, there is definitely a time lag. So you put out content, even if it's the best content out there, if your brand doesn't have the, the strength yet, yep. where you say this is an authority in this space, content alone is not going to do anything. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, so these things all play together. So you talked about, um, you know, strength and, and, and brand and these sort of things that relate to, you know, what the other things we talked about earlier around just what is the brand? What's the value proposition? Um, what's the authority? I love that you talked about authority. Uh, and you also mentioned distribution. So someone like a Mars or uh, an Ahrefs, what they've worked out is, yes, we can really produce high quality content. Uh, and when I talk about high quality, I know you talked about in, in the previous episode um, where, where you were looking at um, not only words on a page, but how are you uh, formatting the page in a way that the user will engage with it? You know, some people prefer video, some people, people prefer audio, um, some people want the, the, the text, you know, you don't want it to look like a textbook that we used to study back in university days where you open it up and literally it's a thousand pages of just text. Uh, and once in a while there'll be a graph, right? Um, it, it's, you need to think about, okay, uh, there's a design element to this and a visual element to this. There's a reason why, you know, Instagram and, and a lot of these tools that are very visually focused have taken off because we'd like to consume with a visual format. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage that if you have a designer or you, you, or you want yourself or you can outsource to someone else um, or work with, you know, Gert's team, whatever it is, you actually think about, okay, take some of the concepts you have written about and then to create visuals that that help uh you know express those concepts in a quick way that people can absorb um or what ahrefs does really well is every piece of content they put out is they actually do a video for it as well yeah. so they do a good you know three or five minute video um that put some animations in there make it a bit fun um and, and so that's you know th that's something you need to consider in terms of the type of content you're putting out which is still mistake number three is focusing on the wrong content mm -hmm. a lot of people focus on uh, even just maybe they'll put up 200 words um, and as we know uh, if we look at, use hrs as a tool to to explore what you see is a lot of the top ranking articles uh, we're looking at a thousand two thousand word plus sometimes mm -hmm. pieces of content right and i think that's very daunting for a lot of business owners because they're like i don't want to write 2000 words that's i can't even get to 300 words um but this comes back to the strategy what is your goal with the content and i, I remember you saying on a previous episode you, you actually said Gert, um that it has to do with you know 30 percent of your production that needs to be in research Absolutely. right it, it has to be if you're not doing that you're doing it wrong you're missing right. the point that's you know absolutely um, i agree with that yeah, definitely. Definitely. I was talking with Ilana Wexler on, on the previous episode here, and uh, she she also um, brings it down to an interesting thing. I I usually got the, thought it was done the other way around, and by no means a Facebook ads ad expert, but she essentially suggested running ads to test a copy of a mm. blog post before you actually post it to the page. So what I, what I knew was happening very often that you keep posting to your page and if something in, gets a lot of engagement, you then promote it as an ad because it's going to do very, very well as an ad. 
What I didn't know was this approach, for example, where you say, okay, I run ads to five different copies, and then I take the two that work the best uh, and the best way, and either put all my money in, in to run ads to those, or take the best copy, and this is going to be then the copy for my organic posting. Mm. So this is going to get the most engagement because the market has decided. And this is something where I say um, very often when we create content for clients or our clients create content, where you say, what is the goal of this content? If this goal, the goal of this content is to rank and, and it's a misconception to think that every single article needs to be on Google. A lot of articles we have on our websites shouldn't be on Google or shouldn't be accessible or indexable for Google because they are just not worth enough. They're not corresponding to any sort search. They're just because we wanted to share them on social media, which is fine. They might do very well and create leads. But once we decide that someone some a con piece of content is there in order to rank, I need to do my research. So I need to check what is ranking on page one on Google. Is this something that really can compete? Right? I can't create a product, a new bicycle today, and it has five wheels instead of two. This is not really what the market apparently wants. Right? I can definitely create my own category, as you're saying, but we know this is a long shot. If I want mm -hmm. to make sales with a five wheels bus bicycle, I need this. It's a higher chance when there are already other five wheels bicycle out, out there that, that sell very well, right? So, so research is definitely um, essential. I like that you say people consume content in different formats. Um, I usually tell my clients because what, what we really often see is podcasters or, or YouTube uh, YouTubers that essentially embed their audio or their video on a page, write 100 words below it just because it looks a little bit weird if it's just a video, but they actually only care about a video. But what they essentially expected is everybody who searches for this topic is searching for a video and is having the time, the 10 minutes it takes to watch this video or 20 or 30 or sometimes half an hour, uh, one hour and a half. So um, where we say, okay, out of 10 people that come to this site, there might be two or three that really want to watch a video and are in the place and in the moment to be able to consume this video, ideally with the audio switched on, right? And you've got a few people that rather want in the entire video content, but they might prefer a transcription, right? Because they are, it's, it's 11 p.m., they're in bed taking their phone and they don't want to switch on the audio, they want to read the description, transcription. And then there are other people who prefer to download this as an ebook or consume like a well-prepared, well-styled formatted content, piece of content. And this is where, where I was also talking with Greg Miralis from Studio One Design about when people really decide to consume the content. So they click on something on Google, they come to a page. Very often, they're not going to even bother reading the headline if the overall visual presentation of this piece of content isn't convincing or doesn't correspond to what they expected. We had clients come to us where I say, look, before we start talking about SEO, ask 10 people because you shouldn't believe me, but ask 10 people about the first impression when they come to your website. The idea, my idea being, I didn't say anything at this stage, my idea being that everybody's going to say this site looks old, it doesn't look serious, I don't trust this site, um, and the design is really ugly, things like those. I don't have to worry about content if the site doesn't communicate my values, my serious appearance, and essentially support my brand. So let me, let me wrap the, the three points up because I think they are really important to, to state here. So first of all, the unclear brand and value proposition. I think this is the biggest one. Um, and definitely uh, we have been guilty of this for too long until we got really serious and, and tried to work it out and, and say, what do we really stand for? Um, the business leading with the product before and building an audience. I think this is a, a big one. And the audience, I understand, I wanted to ask you a question on this one. The audience is, how do you build an audience when you're starting out? Yeah, so uh, I think there's different places. The example I gave was the, the client I worked with who built the audience on LinkedIn. So that's where the, the audience was first. Um, it was a personal, inter interpersonal. Correct. Friendship right. so creation people... or connection creation, yeah? 
Yeah. Um, the other way to do it is if you're just starting out, you can have your website, you can blog, certainly create a blog or a podcast or whatever way you want to do it. Um, but you should also be building an email list at the same time. So mm -hmm. you want to offer and invite people to, hey, if you like this content, why don't you subscribe and I'll send you an update every week or whatever your, your, your cycle is. Um, and then now you have people who, once people signal to you, it's all about signals, right? So when, when someone signals, signals to you, there's an interest uh, and they're giving you an email address, right? That is, you, you've now, they're, they're saying to you, now I, I'm starting to trust you, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, it could be maybe the invitation is not to join the email list. Maybe the invitation is go and connect with me on LinkedIn or connect with me on Instagram or whatever it is, you know, or, or come to my next event, right? Um, so what I used to do when we did a Facebook agency, for example, we built our entire audience, our list, we built it through uh, monthly events that we hosted here in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and a lot of the time we actually went out to other people's audiences and said and pitched to them and said, can we do, do a 40 minute presentation in front of your audience and we'll, we'll give them some value. Um, and, and then the exchange was you give us the list. Right. Yeah. Whoever signs up, they, they, they subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and so now, of course, we're in a time of COVID, so you, that's probably not realistic. But what you can do is what, what a lot of people are doing now is guest podcasting you can actually go and appear on you know in front of other people's audiences um, there are a lot of summits that are happening online you can be a speaker at those summits i was i was recently a speaker at a summit uh, hosted by um, a big uh, marketing agency uh, and their their uh, agreement was once the summit was over they would share the entire audience list with me um, and they literally emailed me a, a list of 3,000 contacts, mm -hmm. right? Um, I had to then vet those because a lot of them didn't fit my um, desired audience or target audience, yeah. um, and then ended up getting 100 subscribed to my, my newsletter mm -hmm. from that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and by request, I didn't just go and add them to my list. I actually emailed them and said, look, I was one of the speakers. You attended my talk. Uh, did, did you want to, you know, get my... Uh, I offered them a, a gift, um, yeah. which helped them, yeah. So... Now, back to your question, yeah, audience building, um, there's different ways you can go about it. I gave you a couple of examples, uh, email list, social media channel, um, you know, if you're using WhatsApp, I know some people are building their lists now on, on WhatsApp, they're actually getting the phone numbers, adding them to a WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually happening in, in Asia, because um, WhatsApp is kind of dominating the market in Southeast Asia right now, right. more so than Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. So um, that's another way about, uh, to do it. That's, that's very interesting. It reminds me of something, uh, I heard Alan Deep from Success First saying at some point, um, he says, yeah, marketing is really a, like a one-to-one -one communication, right? So especially when you say connection, build your audience, go to events, talk to people, get them on your list, get them engaging, get them sharing your content, listening. Essentially what's going on is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And this is where we also say, okay, when we have we had like an interesting parallel to SEO when you're when you're optimizing what's called a meta title and meta description, the search snippet that comes up, it's a one on one conversation, you've got a person with a specific issue with a specific situation in a specific moment, performing a specific search. And if you don't understand what this individual person is going through, you're not going to get the, the first click. So whatever content you have, whatever ranking you have, if you don't get this right, Everything else doesn't doesn't matter. So the one on one conversation, um, I think, just requires that we see things on the long term when it comes to content strategy. We see link things um, with the right angle. See our role. What can we really do in this industry? What can we add in terms of value? And just see this yep. um, as as a very long term. I want to ask you uh, one thing because this is something I think is really coming up a lot and i want to be conscious of your time because you've been generously sharing a lot of value bombs here already um what would you see does it really what should be the the parts of the elements of of a content strategy so content strategy sounds like a very abstract concept especially if you someone's running their their e-com business their drop shipping business their affiliate site etc what should they take into account what what does it take to create a content strategy what are the main elements yeah. models in there yeah love that question i'm going to wrap up the five mistakes before we go into that because this mm -hmm. will it can form the content strategy the fourth the fourth mistake is distribution right so what i see happen is uh, limited what, what what we call spray and pray content promotion it's like mm -hmm. you write an article i'm going to throw it on instagram i'm going to schedule it into you know whatever tool you're using, Buffer, Hootsuite, whatever it is, uh, and you put it out to all your channels. Um, and 
it's you're just praying you're like you hope and and i think you know in the seo world you call it the content the, the spike where the first piece of distribution goes out you're getting clicks through and therefore your your traffic goes up as you see a bump and then you get like it goes to zero right like nothing you know returns to to to, to what it was before um and i think that that when we talk about content strategy understanding where your audience is how they consume and where to reach them is a big part of the strategy right you need to understand the the buyer psychology and then go you know think about this is a common question that marketers like to ask is you know where does your audience like to hang out online okay um and this actually requires you having conversations with your audience people in that audience right um and so you know one of the things is really understanding okay so i've seen someone do this recently a uh, tropical mba they did a survey out to like if they've been running their podcast for i don't know how many years now mm -hmm. but they haven't until this year they didn't do an audience survey to understand um to ask certain questions to better understand their audience all right so um so what they did was they put out a survey and in the survey it literally asked what is your preferred mode of learning right yeah. written video audio whatever what, what blogs are you following all right mm -hmm. what um who, what what tools are you using right so this is something that we all should need to know about our customers right because if you know for example um your customers prefer uh, in the seo world they prefer using uh, ahrefs for you know your agencies like to use that tool for for research versus using an a SEMrush or some other tool right mm -hmm. then it makes sense for you to then go and try and partner with that number one tool that your audience likes right, right? Um, and then get deals and discounts and things like that as well, because that's something that you can negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number four is, is, is just that not a clear content st uh, promotion strategy and not promoting enough. So what I see often is they do, you post the article on your site, you hit publish, you schedule it out on your social media tool, and then that's it, right? The problem with that is, you know, you've done so much work to create this great content, but you're only sharing it once. You're not mm -hmm. sharing it multiple times, right? And you're relying on the SEO Google algorithms, uh, algorithms and things like that to kick in to bring people to, to the content. But if you watch the, the, the people who are doing it well, like you mentioned uh, Moz and Ahrefs and these guys, um, they actually do a tremendous job of promotion, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're running Facebook ads, like what Ilana is talking about and Google ads, and they're doing all these things. They're, they're putting paid budget behind it. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing co content collaborations with other brands um, that get their content out. You know, we talked about um, Ahrefs have that, Tim, Tim Solo did a um, business for blogging course, which he is, mm -hmm. they give away for, for free. Um, and that's been a huge winner for them. Like they literally give that to all their partners and say, hey, this is a free course, go and give it to all your people, right? right. Um, and and that's, that's, a, that's a distribution strategy, okay? So that's, mm -hmm. that's number four. And then number five is selling way too soon. So this comes down to the intent of your content. What are you trying to achieve with the content? Are you there to educate? Are you trying to raise awareness? Or are you trying to sell? right um you need to get clear about that because not all not all content needs to be selling content and not all content should be selling content if every piece of article that you put out on your blog is buy my thing right what do you think that does to the person who visits your site for the first or fifth time right they're just going to get sick of it i'm mm -hmm. done right um, but if you understand that there's actually a buyer journey right and this is a key element to back to your question about what what are the key elements of a content strategy one of the key elements is the buyer journey right understand and map out visually maybe on an excel or google sheet or wherever mm -hmm. you want to do it um pen on paper right these are the steps that the customers our customers typically go through right uh, from the awareness stage through to or the research and awareness stage to the building trust stage to the conversation where i'm going to buy or make the purchase to what happens afterwards right um, there's a great video uh, or talk done by a guy by the name of joey coleman if you look up joey coleman 100 days uh, and google that on youtube or go on find it on youtube he talks about so many marketers and businesses focus on the first like he's mapped out three stages of the buyer journey. Mm -hmm. A lot of us focus on the acquisition stage, which is when we, you know, we're trying to attract someone that's going to buy. Um, what we fail to do is focus on the last three stages, which is the retention stage, mm -hmm. which is once they've converted and they purchased from you, how do you make sure that they don't, they don't leave the next month? Right. Um, and so you can also have content that's designed to keep people around right and continue mm -hmm. to educate them and give them insights and be like hey you know you're working with someone who's going to not only um 
deliver a great service, but we are also going to help you understand these concepts better um, so your business will grow or whatever their objective is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so elements. So we talked about, so first thing that I usually work through is addressing the first mistake is what's the brand? What is the value proposition? Let's get that clear. Okay. So we always start off with who's the audience? What is the your point of differentiation? What do you do differently? Now, it's not always about what do you do the best? Okay, mm-hmm. because everyone makes that claim, right? Yeah. Every business is going to say, I'm the best. We do the yeah. best SEO. We do the best content. Uh, I, I say that's rubbish. Like, <laughs> that's very subjective. And unless you have now, this is why case studies are important, which is why I'm so big on case study marketing is because when you have your clients telling you and telling the market that, that you are great at what you do, that's much more compelling than you going out there going, I'm the best. Does that make sense? Uh, and so. And that actually helps with value proposition and brand. Okay, mm-hmm. um, one key uh, philosophy that, that I want to impart here is uh, if you make yourself the star of your business, right, you're missing the point, right? The star of your business, right, really, or the hero of your business is not you. The hero of the business should be your clients, mm-hmm. right? Because if they're going on a hero's journey, and if you understand, if you understand Joseph Campbell and you've, you've researched the hero's journey. It's a common, um, all our Storytelling, uh, yeah. best stories in the world, you know, Star Wars, whatever it is, the Avengers, they all follow a similar path, mm-hmm. right? And if you look at our lives, we go through a similar path, right? Um, and so your content should also follow that path, right? Because it's one familiar to us, it's innate to us. And when, we, when we're really consuming content, we are looking at what is the journey? Like how, the, how do I go from A to B? Right. And if your content is focused on solving a problem, right, so each piece or article that you put out is, is this is the problem you have because you've searched for it on Google and you found us, right? Here's the steps that you need to take to get to the resolution, right? Mm-hmm. Which is the, 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 the promise, right? Um, and so, again, I want to just restate that because I can't impress it enough is you are not the hero of, of the journey of your own business. The actual heroes are your clients. Right? And so you need to focus them more, you need to talk to them, um, share, teach them, and share their stories. Right? The more you start doing that, um, the more powerful your content becomes. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so, that's, so we talked about, uh, so understand who the audience is, understand their pain points. So something that we typically do is a, a customer or, or buy an empathy map, um, which is, you know, what are their, uh, do you know who Taki Moore is, Gert? Yeah, yeah. He yep. was, he so was like he, quickly at the, uh, show, uh, at, the, at the end, I think, for a moment. Yeah, that's right. He popped in. That's right. Mm-hmm. So um, he's one of the masters of content. Like, like honestly, yeah. if you watch how he does content, and he's just gone all in on video now, yeah. um, but uh, he understands and what he teaches is uh, this idea of the, the customer empathy map and understanding. So if you were to map out, uh, draw a... a um, a grid like x y axis on a piece of paper all right what you want to map out is what are the customers or your think about who your ideal buyer is and then think about what is what are their their uh, pains okay so or start again start with fears what are their key fears right and then look at what what are their frustrations okay fears and frustrations now fear is deep level fear okay so a fear for most business owners is my business will fail right which means i have to go back and get a job Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that's typical for a lot of entrepreneurs, right? So that's a deep lying, fe- uh, deep seated fear. The frustrations are the things that are happening right now in their business. I'm not getting enough clients. I'm not um, getting enough traffic to my site. Uh, you know, my content's not working. These are frustration points, right? Or what we call pains, right? Then you look. You have to look at you, the uh, um, wants. What are the things that they want? Usually, their wants are the opposite of the, of the frustrations. Okay. So I want more traffic. Right. I want my content to resonate. I want to generate more sales. Right. And then you want to look at what the final thing is, the aspiration. Where are they trying to get to with the business or with their life? Right. Mm-hmm. And so you map that all out. That informs your content strategy, because guess what? All your content is going to address those things yeah. and has to mention those things. Right. Because that is showing that you understand who your buyer is. Right. And that makes them relate to the things you put out yeah Mm -hmm. and so um that's a key part and then the last part of the strategy is what i talked about earlier which is the buyer journey we actually map out what is the buyer journey what are the stages and phases that they go through right from learning about you how do they find out about you to when you know what are they consuming as they move through the journey and and what thoughts and concerns might they have right and each piece of content that you put out should address each one of those things 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the conversion point, okay, what do they need to know in, or, in order to buy? And so at this point, we might do things like, you know, um, you might do a sales webinar, you might do a sales call, you might do, um, you know, some kind of comparison table between you and other competitors or even just comparison between your different products and what you offer to help the buyer understand and make a better decision, right? So this is all, you know, I'm talking about like a sales proposal document. So some, a lot of B2B, we do sales proposals. So we send out proposals to our clients. That's content, right? Yep. You don't typically you don't think about it that way, but it is content. And one thing that I do, and I talked about, you know, with, with uh, some of my clients is every proposal you put out should have a case study in there. You should yep. show that you've actually done the work for someone else, you know? Um, and so that's important. So. It, if you have those three key elements, so your brand, what, what you are about, what do you stand for, right? How do you differentiate, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, your, your who you, what we call the audience uh, map, which is basically who the buyer is, what are their pains, frustrations, all those, those four things I talked about earlier. Um, do you remember what they were, Gert? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just uh, gonna test you. Yeah. <laughs> from, the, from the buyer's journey, you're saying? From oh. the, so we would draw the draw the uh, X Y and then you would have yeah the fears, fears and fears and frustrations and aspirations and wants yeah wants, wants and aspirations perfect yeah. right and that's the second part of the, the the strategy the third one is the you map out the buyer journey and then work out what each phase is and then from that all those things then once you have the buyer journey mapped out then you can then produce ideas around what pieces of content you need to be producing and then mm -hmm. you can map that against a timeline or a schedule. Right. So then you, you can yeah. then create probably the fourth part of the, of, the, of the plan is what is the actual execution plan look like? Mm -hmm. I and I would, I would add to that. I would add to that. Just one one final thing would be in all of this thing, when you get to the point where you understand what the content ideas are going to be that talk to the pain points and the consideration phases that your client's going to go through. Uh, at this point, this is when you need to put in, in your checklist or whatever it is, SEO. This is the point where you have to engage and do the mm -hmm. SEO research, maybe get Gert's team to do the, the, that for you, whatever it may be. But Could be a good this, idea. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a very big part of it because if you have ideas, but they're not matched to user intent and user search, you, it's going to be very hard for them to find it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of good points. I want to, to take the opportunity to give a shout out to Taki Moore. I really don't like to consume content in video format, but I, I am definitely watching every single video he puts out there they have like a very very nice length like 10 10 12 minutes he's got like two different cameras he makes it really engaging he's like a very high energy high energy type of type of person who really definitely i agree with you knows how to make content so definitely he's he's doing this the right way and he understands his audience and knows how he needs to illustrate concepts communicate concepts and uh that's awesome so I think this is really great. So we, we want a content strategy. We want to make be clear about our brand. We not, want to understand our audience as much as possible. I like the, the um, uh, empathy map. I think I came across this uh, first in the autoresponder madness course, I think. This was yes. the first first uh, time by Andre Chaperon when I, when I heard about this uh, a few years back. And I really liked the content. And he was, he was specifically, I think, at the end of this module writing, you should go through it again <laughs> because it was like saying, look, if you didn't get this, yes. don't move ahead, right? So he had like a line in there and he said, look, I know you think you understood it, but now do this module again <laughs> and then again. <laughs> and it's really, yeah, it's really fascinating what, what it really takes to understand your audience. Because that part, the part where people get that wrong is they'll do the MPF map as an exercise, as, as a um, you know a theoretical or a psychological exercise, right? Because the problem is you're making assumptions that you know what your buyers actually, what their fears and frustrations and pains and things are, right? The way you solidify that it's correct is you actually then have to go and have conversations with those buyers, right? And say, tell me about your pains, right? Uh, one way that you can do this is actually interview 
those clients on your podcast or even don't have to do it publicly. You can actually just Zoom call, let's have a chat mm -hmm. for 20 minutes. I just want to ask you some questions to, to better de deliver a better service for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's a really great way to understand that. And so, so then you can just validate what you've got on the empathy map. And what you'll find is you might be surprised about some of the things, right? Um, when we were doing this exercise for the co-working space, we had assumptions about each type of, of customer that we had Right. And we actually went through the exercise of getting the community managers to sit down with each of those clients, at least three or five people who fit that profile and just ask them some serious, some questions um, mm -hmm. to validate that we had what we had was correct. And once we had that, then we went and produced all this content on our blog and, and things like this that then spoke to those those pain points and those, those desires and aspirations. And that actually increased our traffic because people then were starting to engage with that content they're like oh actually you understand you know my frustration so i want to talk to you you know yeah absolutely this is also something i really bring up uh we work for some people uh in the website flipping space buying selling online businesses buying selling websites affiliate uh sites very often and what i essentially tell them is look if this is a space you're not familiar with and this happens very often because they come across a good investment opportunity purchase a site spend the first the next weeks really diving into this audience as much as you can because i can provide a keyword research i can get a basic understanding we're covering all ranges of industry from from i don't know electric smokers to high speed internet to ferrets to e-com businesses to i don't know what we cover a, a lot of things and it's it's interesting that suddenly you get like a, a basic understanding of a lot of things you never thought you would be in touch uh, next month is going to be hair extensions um, we and then, but you, you can't go really that deep. So mm. we need the client to really understand their industry. And this is where I tell them, look, go sign up for Facebook groups, sign up for every newsletter you can get your hands on in this niche. Mm, get to know the vocabulary, the topics. There are always the same issues coming up. And once you really understand them, then you can go through our keyword research, our target research, our topic research and evaluate what are really the most important points you know are coming up in this industry because there might be other keywords that are also important but not driving forces. And the way I really, really like this concept you brought up with parallel content where it's okay, we can write a lot of content and everything can be interesting, but we can essentially um, have like a very shallow content that doesn't really yes. make a difference. And if I come across this, I'm not going to trust the next article either, right? So I have spent some time reading an article that I is not really high value. I click back, click on something else. And this is one of the signals then Google picks up over time that says, okay, what whoever I send to this site comes back, they seem to be not really engaged, not really happy with what they find. Why should they ultimately rank this page? I really want to, to uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, no, I was gonna say like, you you and your team have done a fantastic job of that for me like when when we did the the audit for my site um you know you highlighted that that i actually had a piece of parallel content that's performing really well that's bringing a lot of traffic which is the there's an article i have on you know uh, whether or not you should join bni networking group or something like this right. um, and i'm ranking quite well for that keyword but that's not converting to prospective buyers because like, mm -hmm. that the intent is different they're not there to learn about content and strategy they're there to learn about networking um which is right. not what i, I t teach or sell right mm -hmm. so um what you did do is your team gave us gave me some really strong recommendations on well these are keywords that you probably should focus on which is more has more user intent and more buyer intent um, and that's going to help you get better leads mm -hmm. uh, and i love that and, and that was really awesome Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think there's definitely a lot of a lot of opportunity on on many, many sites getting content right, getting content um, tackled from a strategic approach rather than just pushing something out. So we have something to share on Facebook or something to send our uh, email list to. Um, I really want to thank you for all the value you brought here. We're probably going to invite you to another podcast because I know there are a lot of other topics. I definitely want to talk you to you about branding. I definitely want to talk to you about uh, events because we just know that in SEO is one of the pillars. I'm far away from saying everybody should do SEO and nothing else. I know this is, uh, we need to be um, conscious that SEO is part of it. It's, I think it can be working very well. It shouldn't be working on its own. And, and where we really see it is, is 
when people start going a little bit broader and also focus on social, also focus on strategy, also attend events, also do speaking, also strengthen their brand, also do PR work, etc. Everything really comes together and fits really tightly. Whereas if someone says, no, we don't pay a dollar on a click, we only want to do SEO. This can work, especially if you started a few years ago. Or even if we start now and find a really good niche and do a lot of target research um, and, and keyword research, really get your audience and have excellent writers, it can still work. But I think it should never be the only strategy someone uh, bets on or someone focuses on. There needs to be like an overall strategy people pursue here um, yes. in order to stand on a very solid ground. So I really want to, to thank you a lot here for your uh, contribution. Uh, I hope we can get you on another episode talking a little bit more about content. It's just going to be a repetitive theme here. And I think there we can go a little bit narrower than on, on different aspects like the empathy map maybe or like the, like the branding in general. Um, and be conscious of your time. Thank you so much. What would be a, a good way to get in touch with you if people want to know more, need a copywriter or especially need someone to get an um, key case, case study going yep so i've just put together some um bonus resources for for people listening to this they can just go to uh, www.simplecreativemarketing.com forward slash gert g-e-r-t um nice. and nice. Uh, if you hop on there you can just yeah i'll, I'll put a, a free case study guide for those who want to learn more about case study mm -hmm. i'll put an article which elaborates more on this conversation we've had here um and talks about some tips for effectively marketing b2b and professional services uh, in addition to what we've already shared in this episode um, so go over there and there's just some resources that you can go and grab awesome this is i really appreciate you putting this together for our audience and for this this was great thank you so much um, if you're listening to this and you think you want to get your copywriting right or finally get like a content strategy going and really have a strategic long-term approach. Content is a long-term game, but it's definitely worth it. Get in touch with Anthony. I know he's working for some of our clients as well and they seem to be pretty happy with what he is putting together and how he approaches this. So uh, definitely we are going to work with Anthony as well on uh, a couple of case studies soon. So definitely go over to simplecreativemarketing.com. Thank you very much, Anthony. This is episode eight of the SEOleverage.com podcast. My name is Gerd Menlach. Thank you so much. Bye.